It's been a long time. It sure has. What's up, folks? Mike for CMCC Builds here with the return of the Character Build series. Oh, finally. I know it's been entirely too long since the last one. I miss these things. If you enjoy the series and want to see more, it's important you like and subscribe. And if you really like the series, consider joining my Patreon so you can voice your opinion and support the channel. That way I can do more of these. Ideally, I'd like to do at least one character build a month, but to do that, I need to start. Putting in the hard yards, turning pains into gains. As a reminder, the goal of these videos is not to create a build that feels like the character or pick a class slash subclass that is thematically similar to the character. There are dozens of other channels and articles that do just that to varying degrees of quality and success. What we're trying to accomplish here is creating the most accurate version of the character within the D&D 5e rule set using official D&D 5e content. Using the in-game mechanics, I'm going to give you the closest version of that character. We're going to get as many of the character's abilities and skills into the build as possible. From there, it's completely up to you how you want to play it. If I provide four classes in a build and the final one is chosen just to get a very specific spell that rounds out the character, you may personally not care about that ability and the final multi-class. In that case, you should totally ignore it and whittle down the build to fit your needs and playstyle. Remember, this isn't the right way to build the character, it's a right way to build it. Alright, this time around we're here with a build very near and dear to my heart. A character that heavily influenced my very first 5e build. You saw the thumbnail, you clicked the vid. The Space Viking, aka the God of Thunder, aka Thor Odinson. Over the years there have been many faces of Thor. The one we're gonna look at is... nope, not that one. No, although that could be cool. Haven't seen it. Definitely not that one. Ah uh, yes, these faces. All of them? Well, we'll cover all the important Thor abilities. Fighting, lightning, hand-to-hand, -hand, Mjolnir, blasting people back. But we're not going to stop there. Nearly every version of a Thor build will start and end with Mjolnir, and that's fine. That's the traditional Thor we all know and love. But a Warhammer in 5e isn't meant to be thrown. That's the purview of the light hammer. And wielding a single-handed weapon without a shield is often pretty bad in 5e, with some notable exceptions. So what do we do with Thor? Well, it just so happens that the Thor of the last five years isn't the traditional hammer-wielding Thor. Why? Because Hela crushed Mjolnir like an egg, and Thor formed a new relationship with a new weapon that works much better in the 5e context, Stormbreaker. But Mike, doesn't Thor get Mjolnir back and give Stormbreaker to his adoptive daughter at the end of Love and Thunder? Sure, if you want to build the no-shield, single-handed, hammer-wielding version of Thor, you always have one of those other builds to check out. If you think a champion fighter or storm sorcerer is a good fit for Thor, then there are plenty of those builds out there. But for this one, if you want to build a Thor that can do stuff like this... Then stick around. That's right, we're building a Stormbreaker and Mjolnir wielding Thor, using both in combat together. How are we going to do that? Let's bolt into the build. With the racial selection, pretty much everyone picks Asimar here, and we're gonna do the same, but not for the reasons you may suspect. Yes, Asimar are divine, angelic beings, and that flavor is reminiscent of the North divinity of traditional Thor, the actual god, but we're building MCU Thor, which is more akin to a superpowered alien than a god. Asgardians, even the names Asgard and Asimar are similar, live for thousands of years with magical powers, often with misguided superiority complexes. Honestly, in flavor, they remind me more of Tolkien elves than anything else. But again, we're taking the Asimar because of mechanics. Mechanics trumps flavor. The Asimar gets celestial resistance, giving them resistance to necrotic and radiant damage. Obviously, lightning and thunder resistance would have been the best, but we'll take any damage resistance on a build like this, because if Thor is anything, it's ultra resilient. Lightning, thunder, and radiant damage are all in the same wheelhouse for me. I know Radiant is more like damaging divine light, but it's close enough, and if there's anything close to divine light, it's certainly the energy of a star, and we know Thor is certainly resistant to that. The Air Genasi is a very strong option for this build, and if I was looking for a pure power version of it, I might go this route and modify my first subclass choice. The Air Genasi gets the much needed lightning resistance while also providing three spells we'll want in this build. Shocking Grasp, Feather Fall, and Levitate. But what's better than levitating? 
You. You're better than levitating. But apart from that, what else is better? Flying. And the Asimar, in addition to healing hands and light bearer, gets Radiant Soul, which causes the Asimar to sprout spectral wings and gain a flying speed equal to your walking speed. Of course, those spectral wings will actually be a blanket of lightning and blue electricity carrying you off the ground. Flight is an essential part of the Thor build, and although he's actually throwing his hammer and being dragged across the sky more so than actually flying, when he acquires Stormbreaker, he also attains a more traditional form of flight. Whichever pick you make, even custom lineage works great here, you really can't go wrong. For ability scores, remember, we're not trying to mimic the actual physical and mental attributes of the character, that would be impossible with the point by method, and make for an extremely boring character in most cases. We're trying to pick the attributes that allow us to use the mechanics we need via multiclassing, attack bonuses, and save DCs, etc. You'll need to take a 15 in strength, this is of course a strength based character, if we're going to be swinging a great axe, an embarrassingly low 9 dexterity, a 14 in constitution, which is lower than I'd like, but it's where we have to be to get a 13 in intelligence, a 13 in Wisdom, and an 8 in Charisma. Use Racial ASIs to bump 3 stats by plus 1 Strength, Intelligence, and Wisdom. For background, everyone likes to take Noble because Thor is the son of King Odin, except this gives the History and Persuasion skills. Neither are befitting of MCU Thor. With later iterations of the character, he's a bumbling fool with a good heart. Early iterations had him as a brash warrior type. Shoot first, ask questions last. Easily manipulated and quick to anger. The Noble's background feature, Position of Privilege, seems to fit in terms of flavor, but Thor isn't really accommodated by common folk or welcomed into high society. That's not really a thing in the movies, especially after he rejects his position as King of Asgard. So we'll take a custom background, two skills and two languages, along with the Haunted One background feature, Heart of Darkness, and the background characteristics of a Noble. Why Heart of Darkness? Well, the best moments of Thor tend to be those moments of reflection when he considers all that he's lost. And he's lost a lot. Well, he's been dead before. You know, this time I think it really might be true. And you said you, your sister and your dad? Both dead. But still got a mom, though? Killed by a dark elf. A best friend? Stabbed through the heart. That darkness is the primary character arc for Thor in both Endgame and Love and Thunder, as he learns to cope with yet another loss of a loved one. We're going to pick up two important physical skills in a moment, but for now, with the two skills... Take Intimidation, because he is the God of Thunder. I am the God of Thunder! Wow. I didn't hear any thunder, but out of your fingers, was that like sparkles? Sometimes less intimidating than others. And Perception, because I don't love any of the other skills, and it's the best one in the game. For languages, Dwarvish and Elvish are no-brainers. Both races were born from Northern Germanic and Norse mythology, and both Elves and Dwarves have major connections to mythological Thor and MCU Thor's story. Now the good stuff, starting class. I've seen Paladin, Sorcerer, Hexblade Warlock, but if you're playing Thor, there is only one starting class, Fighter. There's another class that you're probably thinking of right now, especially given the religious connections of the mythological Thor, but despite the complementary features that class can provide, it's Fighter that can provide the most mechanical similarities to the Warrior. With the two proficiencies, here we'll take the big physical skills, Acrobatics and Athletics. Our Thor's dex is atrocious, so getting any bump we can from a skill perspective is always welcome, and Athletics on this build is a no-brainer. The much tougher decision comes when selecting Fighting Style. There are several good choices, some more powerful than others, and less powerful options filling in gaps in the build. The first obvious choice is defense, all of these MCU superheroes are tough as can be, protected by the almighty plot armor, but we know Thor can take a punch, so a bump to AC fits well. Great Weapon Master is in a great fighting style, but works well with the great axe he will wield. Throne Weapon Fighting of course fits perfect for the hammer throwing Thor. Any of these are perfectly reasonable choices, but as I've done in the past with other builds, these MCU characters often need a viable mechanism to fight with their hands and feet, and to do that, we'll take the unarmed fighting style. This gives a d6 unarmed attack as opposed to strength mod only. That bumps to a d8 with no weapons or shield wielded, which is a viable scenario, and if a creature is grappled by Thor, he can do a bonus d4 damage at the start of a turn. With a skill investment into athletics, this will likely come up during a campaign. Pick whichever fits your playstyle or needs, but if we're trying to make the most accurate version of Thor, unarmed fighting is the pick. With equipment, we want a great axe, plate armor, and a light hammer, not a warhammer. Mjolnir needs to be thrown, and the only non-magical 5e hammer that has the thrown weapon property is the light hammer. A d4 sucks, I get it, but throwing a non-thrown weapon sucks more. We'll discuss magic weapons later. There are a healthy number of options to replicate Stormbreaker and Mjolnir in the 5e landscape. 
Skipping past Second Wind and Action Surge, we'll head right to level 3 for the big subclass Martial Archetype selection. I've seen people take Champion here, please don't do that. Champion is a mechanically flavorless subclass, and there is a much better option sitting right there. This is probably the most common one taken in Thor builds, and there's good reason for that. Of course, we're talking about Eldritch Knight. We're here for the EK's primary feature, spellcasting, but the secondary ability, basically a ribbon feature, weapon bond, is an absolutely perfect fit for Thor. You create a magical bond between yourself and up to two weapons. A bond, you say? Sounds like you had a pretty special, intimate relationship with this hammer, and losing it was almost comparable to losing a loved one. Once bonded, you can't be disarmed. Not identical to someone else, not being able to pick it up, but certainly a good proxy. But most importantly, if it's on the same plane of existence, you can summon that weapon as a bonus action on your turn. You do cause it to teleport, but just flavor it as the weapon flying at near light speed directly into your hand. The limit of two weapons is again perfect for this build. The Hexblade has a similar feature with their packed weapon, but the flavor is just a bit off. But that's also another decent option for this ability. At level 4, you get Martial Versatility as an optional class feature, so if the fighting style you selected isn't working for you, you can switch that out with one of the other options presented. And at this level, we get our first ASI feat, and here we needed to take Great Weapon Master. This gives a bonus action attack whenever we score a critical or kill an enemy. This is Thor. He's 1500 years old and killed twice as many enemies as that. You're going to get some bonus action attacks with this feat, and perhaps more importantly, you get the negative 5 plus 10 ability. Take a negative 5 to your attack and get a plus 10 to damage. This works great with attack bonuses and advantage, so do your best to make that happen. Shove enemies prone, tell your fellow adventurers you'll buy them a beer if they throw up a web or fairy fire, or work with your DM to get some of the magic weapons we'll discuss later. Of course, by work with, I mean pay off with high praise and extravagant gifts. At level 5, extra attack, and at level 6, fighters get another ASI feat. Here we gotta go with Gift of the Chromatic Dragon. Once per long rest, this allows you to infuse a weapon with several different damage types, but we're going to use lightning every single time. This feat allows a proficiency bonus per long rest use of your reaction to gain resistance to several different damage types, including lightning. This, of course, fits perfectly with Thora, who's extremely resistant to... Hey, Mike, you sure about that? Uh, I don't know what the hell's going on here. He blasts himself with lightning and is functionally immune. We're going to take two more levels in Fighter here to get level 2 spells, and more importantly, for this build, the War Magic feature. When you use your action to cast a cantrip, you can use a bonus action to make a weapon attack. Now you can cast a cantrip like Booming Blade, which does, you guessed it, thunder damage. At this level, it's an additional 1d8 thunder damage to the initial hit, and 2d8 thunder damage if the target moves willingly. And you can use your bonus action to make another Great Axe Swing. And at level 8, we can take Martial Adept with the feat, gaining the Quick Toss and Precision Attack features. Why Quick Toss? Well, if you want to fight with Stormbreaker and Mjolnir, this is the way. At this point, you can attack twice with Stormbreaker, use Quick Toss to pull out Mjolnir, and attack from range as a bonus action, adding the additional d6 to the damage roll. You can also attack with Stormbreaker, and if you kill an enemy, draw Mjolnir, throw it, and move in to take the extra bonus action attack with Stormbreaker from Great Weapon Master or simply Booming Blade with Stormbreaker, dealing big damage from Great Weapon Master and taking a second negative 5 plus an attack as a bonus action via War Magic. Lots of options. If you're not using Quick Toss, then Precision Attack allows that negative 5 plus 10 ability to land whenever you need it to land. Unfortunately, you only get one use per short rest, which sucks, but we're making the best of what we get here. Let's touch on the spells we'll pick up with Eldritch Knight before we hop out of Fighter for a bit. For the cantrips, Booming Blade is a must grab for the reasons previously mentioned, Shocking Grasp is another big one, especially post-Ragnarok when Thor learns to lean less on his hammer and use the power coursing through his veins to win combats. Level 1 spells, and remember as an EK we can only pick two spells not from the Abjuration and Evocation schools. Absorb Elements for more of that energy absorption ability necessary to replicate one of the most powerful beings in the universe, who also happens to be able to control lightning. Chromatic Orb is an interesting one. It's flavored as a 4 inch diameter sphere that can be lightning or thunder damage, among other types we don't care about. It's a single target attack roll that does 3d8 damage. Now everyone talks about this ability from Thor. Some of these. It's a lightning bolt, right? Well, not really, at least not a 5e lightning bolt. Mike, what are you talking about? That is a lightning. Read the lightning bolt spell. It doesn't hit a target and stop. It travels 100 feet in a line, striking anyone in the path. Thor's lightning bolts don't really do that. They hit one person, and the person behind them is safe. 
Now that's not always the case, but it's most often the case. So in that sense, the better analog for Thor's horizontal lightning blast is actually this chromatic orb spell. And it's evocation, so we're going to snatch that up. We'll take Feather Fall with the first of our any school spells. Thor can fall from great heights, sometimes very slowly. He can kind of float with lightning, so Feather Fall it is. Yes, I know the Storm Sorcerer lets you float in the air 10 feet when you cast a spell, but this works just fine for our needs. Sorcerer doesn't provide enough to warrant a dip or even a dive into the class. We'll take Shield. Does Thor have any ability like the Shield spell? Have you lost it? We'll take Shield. And finally, Thunder Wave. We'll trade this spell out when we come back to Fighter, but for now, blast away. Don't forget, you can blast the ground, and Thor does that often, but you can also blast in front of you or behind you. You're on the face of the cube. With the two level 2 spells, Shatter works as a good proxy for a powerful thrown Mjolnir. We'll have some more spell analogs for Mjolnir in a bit, but for now this works well. The spell does thunder damage, so it fits right in line with what Mjolnir can do. Dragon Breath would be fantastic if we could use it to infuse a sentient magic item like Stormbreaker or Mjolnir and have them shoot out cones of lightning as their action, but alas, it's not to be. So instead, pick up Levitate with the second school free spell. Mjolnir makes Thor fly, but his lightning makes him levitate. At this point, we've taken 3 feats, and we haven't bumped strength at all. Why is that? Why are we waiting so long to max strength? First, there's a strong argument to make that taking important feats like Great Weapon Master is more important than an ASI. The math generally bears that out. Second, the longer we push off major investments into strength and don't kid yourself an ASI at the cost of a feat is just that. The more time you have to figure out if you can get your hands on an often easily acquired strength boosting magic item like Ogre Gauntlets or Belts of Giant Strength. If you can get those before you spend any ASI on strength, then you can forego ASI to get any number of fantastic feats in its place. If you do the opposite and invest in strength only to come across one of these magic items later in the campaign, well... No way, this is bogus, man! Finally, and perhaps most importantly, delaying strength for feats completes the character skills and abilities quicker. We want to do Thor stuff as quick as possible, and this is the way to do that. Now, it's time to double down on the god portion of Thor and multi-class out of fighter, and into Cleric. You probably guess that's where we're going. Tempest Cleric gives us too much good stuff to ignore. It's incredibly annoying that we need both intelligence and wisdom for our lightning and thunder spells, but such is the way of the Eldritch Knight and the Tempest Cleric multiclass. The Tempest Domain's bonus proficiencies are completely redundant, but that's okay because we get full caster spell progression, the Cleric spell list, the Tempest spell list, which has some real goodies for this build, and at level 1, Wrath of the Storm. Someone hits you with an attack, and it's out of the shield plus 5 range, or you don't want to blow a spell slot, you can use your reaction, wisdom mod times per long rest, in this case 2, to do 2d8 lightning or thunder damage. Not much at level 9, but it's something to do with your reaction if you don't have better use for it. And with later Tempest abilities, you can boost that power level to make it a decent effect. At level 2, the standard Cleric Channel Divinity to turn undead doesn't fit with this character well, but... You can use that channel divinity to harness divine power and recover spell slots, or destructive wrath to cause your lightning or thunder damage spells to max out without a roll. You want to call down the biggest lightning bolt in the history of lightning? This is the way to do that. At level 4 we get another ASI feat, and here we're finally going to bump strength, but only if we didn't acquire a strength boosting magic item. If you did, then lucky you. Bump intelligence, wisdom, or take a feat like tough, slasher, or crusher. At level 6, you can use Channel Divinities twice between short rests, which is great to max out lightning and thunder spells like Call Lightning and Shatter, more on the specific cleric spells in a bit. More importantly, at level 6 we get Thunderbolt Strike. When you deal lightning damage to a large or smaller creature, you can also push it up to 10 feet away from you. What does Thor do? He bashes things. What happens when those things get bashed? They get flung around in the air, on the ground, through things, doesn't matter. When he hits you, you move. Now we can do that. You can combo this with Wrath of the Storm to push enemies back that hit you. If you hit them with the Booming Blade, now they take 3d8 rider damage just to hit you again. Got less than 24 hit points? Why not toss a Destructive Wrath on top to max out the thunder damage with no saving throw? Dead. Thunderbolt Strike obviously works really well with Chromatic Infusion. Now each strike with your weapon can push enemies back 10 feet. No additional resources spent. Your Call Lightning and Chromatic Orb Blast, Shocking Grasps, and others can now push enemies into area of effect hazards or off cliffs in addition to their normal damage, which can also be maxed out when needed. Nothing insanely powerful here, just incredibly fun. We'll finish off Cleric with a 7th level, bringing us to character level 15. That gives us 4th level spells, 
So let's go ahead and dive into those cleric spells. For the cantrips, guidance is always a good grab. It's a d4 to someone's ability check, and that includes your own initiative roll. That can help balance out the terrible initiative from the low dexterity score. Resistance, because cleric cantrips are not particularly good, and Thor should have good saving throws whenever possible. He's functionally resistant to everything. Thaumaturgy, because altering the appearance of your eyes, creating a booming voice, and causing flames to flicker is a no-brainer. And finally, Word of Radiance. You can play this as either Radiant Lightning blasting from your body and hitting everyone within 5 feet, or you can flavor this as a quick toss of Mjolnir circling around you and returning to your hand. Sure, the damage from the spell is Radiant, but Mjolnir was forged in the heart of a dying star. It's not a stretch to assume its damage is partially Radiant. With the first level preparations, I like Cure Wounds, which may sound off, but Stormbreaker very clearly heals Thor when he was dying on the floor of Eitri's forge room at Nidavellir. Fog Cloud is an auto-prep Tempest spell, and it's a very strong first level spell. Does it fit Thor? Certainly. He has summoned Cloud Cover multiple times during his adventures, including when Odin dies in his final battle with Thanos. Shield of Faith is just a strong defensive option, a plus two to AC that can be flavored however you like. He's Thor, his AC should be high. And finally, another auto prep spell from Tempest, Thunder Wave. Since we already have the spell with our EK selections, we'll have to unselect it when we take more levels in Fighter. Level 2 preparations give Gust of Wind as an auto prep spell. Not a great fit, although Thor can generate strong wind gusts. Although Thor can generate strong gusts of wind by spinning his hammer rapidly, so the in story analog is there. Shatter is auto prepped and a great analog for Mjolnir, as mentioned before. Again, this was picked up with our EK spells, so we'll have to switch that out later as well. Spiritual Weapon is another spell that may seem not to fit, but as another Mjolnir option, it's absolutely perfect. 60 foot range with 20 feet of movement and a D8 plus Wisdom mod damage as a bonus action. You're throwing Mjolnir around after round at range. Oddly enough, Thor is even mentioned in the spell description, so there's that for whatever that's worth. With third level spells, we get the big one, Call Lightning. And this really is Thor's thing, even more so than Lightning Bolt. Raining down bolts from above becomes a bigger part of his game after Mjolnir is gone, but he certainly wouldn't hesitate to rain down blasts earlier in his MCU journey. This spell is an auto prep slot from Tempest, which is great. Protection from energy provides hour long resistance to a damage type of our choice. Guess which one we'll choose. Slate Storm is auto prepared and a bit of a stretch for Thor's weather controlling powers, but it's a great spell and you should use it. Because if he can control the cloud cover and create lightning from the sky, if it starts to rain and sleet in a specific area, I wouldn't be surprised. Spirit Guardians, because it's absolutely the best on a melee character like this. And of course we're going to flavor that radiant energy as divine lightning flashing around us like Ragnarok or Infinity War or Thor. I love the imagery here, and it's a super powerful spell and such a great upcast for this build. Along the same lines, Spirit Shroud adds another D8 of Radiant, or Cold Necrotic, which we won't choose, to every attack. This can really add up fast when we get 3 or 4 attacks in a turn and up to 7 with an action surge. With the 4th level spell choices, Banishment is a cool pickup. Use Stormbreaker to summon the Bifrost on another creature, sending them to another plane of existence. If they get cut in half, so be it. I don't love control water, but it's auto prepped. Death Ward, however, works well with a character that is nearly impossible to kill. Divination might seem not to fit, but Thor has done some divining in his time. In Age of Ultron, the infamous water scene, he's used Heimdall as a conduit to see the unseeable, often asking the specific question to the all-seeing, all-hearing protector of Asgard. And with a final auto prep spell, we get Ice Storm. If Sleet Storm is a thing, I'm cool with Ice Storm, but the spell sucks, so don't cast it. We're going to leave Cleric now, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention going to level 9 with Cleric. This gives two big things that I'd love to have on this character. Divine Strike for an extra 1d8 of thunder damage once per turn. Not huge, but a nice little addition. And at Cleric 9, Tempest Clerics get the Paladin spell Destructive Wave, and this spell is so absolutely perfect for Thor. If you want to blast the ground with Radiant and Thunder damage, knocking prone all in its path with a failed save, then this is the best spell or feature option for you. I had a 100% plan to go this way, but I kept getting pulled in opposite directions by this guy until I gave in. So instead, we're jumping back into Fighter at character level 16 for a 9th level. We'll take Fighter right to level 20, Fighter 13, which gives some good stuff. Indomitable at 9 is decent on this build because we're a very mad build with decent stats and strength, con, intelligence, and wisdom. Rerolling a failed save in 4 of the 6 stats provides a decent option to succeed in many cases. Fighter 10 gives Eldritch Strike. A landed weapon attack gives an enemy disadvantage on their next save against your spells, excellent for a build with very modest DCs due to 14s in both spellcasting stats. Fighter 11, character level 18 gets us that wonderful third attack. Whichever version of this build you decide to make for yourself, plan to go the full 11 with Fighter. 
That third attack is super strong, both mechanically and thematically, as the tie-ins to a warrior god that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Suter, defeat Thanos twice, arguably get the better of Hulk twice. Like, literally arguable. Smash you. She didn't smash anything. I, I won that fight. I smashed you. Yeah, sure, sure. And is very clearly one of the most powerful melee combatants in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. At Fighter 12, we finally max strength. But let's be honest, you should have gotten a strength based magic item by now. And at 13th level, EKs get 3rd level spells. It took forever, but we're here. So let's talk about those Eldritch Knight spells. With the final cantrip, take either Sword Burst to represent Stormbreaker spinning around you and slaying enemies, or Thunderclap as a Mjolnir's version of the same thing. Neither is a perfect puzzle piece, but both are serviceable. With 13 levels in Eldritch Knight, we finally get third level wizard spells, and the two big ones we want are Fly, because Thor can fly, sort of. There is his Mjolnir version of Flight. I, I used to spin it really fast, and it would, it would pull me off the- Oh my god, him I pulled you off. His the lightning provides some type of flight capabilities, and Stormbreaker gave him more traditional types of flight. Well, sometimes I guess. Fly is the final spell school free selection, and then we can also take Lightning Bolt. At level 20, it's not great. It's not particularly great at level 5, to be honest. But you can upcast this at 6 level to do 11d6 damage and max that damage out. I would do this only if you have a headband of intellect and had already hit your primary target with an attack, thus giving them disadvantage on the save. I would almost certainly save that 6 level slot for Spirit Guardians or maybe Call Lightning instead. Repeated 60 10 damage in a 9 square area is pretty strong, especially if you can max that once or twice. But either way, if you're building Thor, you probably want a traditional lightning bolt, and this is the way to get it. You have three spell selections remaining, and I would take whatever works for your needs. Continual Flame works as an analog for Asgard's Eternal Flame. Witch Bolt for a d12 damaging lightning spell. Upcast combined with some form of advantage and maxed out with Destructive Wrath can do some serious damage. And if you want to capture Love and Thunder Mjolnir that can assemble and disassemble at will, propelling itself towards enemies as auto-hit force damaging pellets, the Magic Missile spell isn't a bad analog at all. Okay, now let's discuss some of the magic items that can really pull this build together, starting with the attribute boosting items. If you can get your hands on a headband of intellect to boost intelligence, that allows you to dump intelligence and invest more heavily into wisdom as a stat. Remember, you need wisdom to multi-class into cleric, but you don't need intelligence to be an Eldritch Knight. Only do this if you've worked out with your DM how and roughly when you'll be able to get the headband. Going 10 levels in the fighter only to find that you're not getting the headband until fighter 11 is gonna be a rough ride. Gauntlets of Ogre Power let you bump your strength up to 19 for a plus 4 modifier. You kind of get stuck there with this magic item, as ASI will have no effect until you hit 20, at which point the magic item is useless. Your other option is to instead switch to a belt of giant strength, which will bump your strength from a 21 to a 29 depending on the type of giant belt you have. It's gotta be the storm giant, I mean, come on, it's Thor. Now for the weapons. There is the Dwarven Thrower. It does require attunement by a dwarf, but for this build, the DM has to cut you some slack. Especially since Mjolnir and Stormbreaker were forged by the King of Dwarves. It's a Warhammer, so much closer to Mjolnir than the Light Hammer. You get a plus 3 to attack and damage rolls, and even better, it has the Throne property with a range of 20 and 60 feet. It deals an extra 1d8 on a hit, 2d8 if you're a giant, as Guardians hate the Giants, just like the Dwarves. And best of all, the weapon immediately flies back to your hand after the attack. This is Mjolnir in 5e. Then for Stormbreaker, this is the Axe of Dwarvish Lords. It's a battle axe, which is not ideal, but it takes on the properties of the aforementioned Dwarven Thrower, a belt of Dwarven Kind, and a Sword of Sharpness so you can lop off limbs along with doing additional damage on crits. The Axe has other abilities like Teleportation, very similar to Stormbreaker's ability to summon the Bifrost. It comes with other abilities like summoning an Earth Elemental and a Curse to make the wielder look Dwarvish, but whatever, the other stuff is cool. Then there is Whelm, a sentient Warhammer with the Throne weapon property and a penchant for killing goblins and giants. It's a plus three weapon that sends out a shockwave in a 60 foot radius to stun enemies. And finally, I should mention the Hammer of Thunderbolts, a plus one maul, so not exactly a great start. It requires both gauntlets of ogre power and a belt of giant strength. Why both, since the gauntlets do nothing? I don't know. But the weapon gives a plus four to strength, and with the cost of a charge, can be thrown with a range of 20 and 60 feet. If it hits, creatures within 30 feet that fail their saving throw will be stunned. Again, not bad, but probably the worst of the four options as an analog to Mjolnir or Stormbreaker. Work with your DM to figure out which of these weapons they'll let you get your hands on. You can borrow the plot from Thor 1 and have your backstory involve losing said weapon because you're no longer worthy and spend your adventuring career trying to regain your lost honor while trying to find the weapon's location and prove your worth so the sentient tool will accept you again. So that's the build, that's everything. 
Tell me what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you liked the video, please like the video and share and subscribe, all the YouTube things. Thanks folks, see you here next time. The best you can do! Yeah, kind of.